We are on the air, quiet in the studio, in five, four, three. Hi, good evening ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our really swell Christmas time, Christmas tidings, here at WXMAS here in 1938. Ah, yes, and you all look great in your Christmas gear. Um, I've got a bunch of actors that we've come here to, we come every year to WXMAS to, you know, just spread the word that Charlie Dickens, uh, that, that great little writer, uh, put out years ago, and uh, we hope you enjoy our show. Um, I have a special guest with us tonight, all right? Roxanne Cambridge. The sign up. Put the <laughs> Cambridge, Conway's own, living right up the street, has just finished a tour and is going to start our evening off with a song from the past. Roxanne Cambridge, everybody. <laughs> to sing a song masters in this hall and I would love for you to sing along at home or in the audience. Masters in this hall, the hear your news today, brought from overseas and ever I you pray. No one, no one, no one, well, no one sing we clear, hope that all our folk on earth born is got some so dear. No one, no one, no one, well, no God today hath poor folk raised and cast her down the proud. Going o'er the hills through the milk white snow, heard I you as plea, and while the wind did blow, no, well, no, well, no, well, sing we clear. Hope that all our folk on earth born is God son so dear. No, no, well, no, well, no, well, sing we loud. God today. Folk raised and cast it down the proud. A third verse, here we go. Then to Bethlehem town we went to and to, and in a sorry place heard the oxen low. No, 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 we sing, we clear. Oh, the day or no day, God is such and so dear. No, 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 we sing, we clear. God today hath put full grace. And cast her down the path. One more time. No, 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 sing we clear. Hope and all our folk on earth born is got some so dear. No, 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 sing we learn. God today hath both book raised and cast her down the Roxanne, that was wonderful. I know what you folks out there in Radio Land and here in our live studio audience, uh, Roxanne and her group, Tiny uh, Glass Tavern, will be appearing in Haydenville uh, at the Cong Congregational Church on January 20th. Okay. If you have not heard her and her group, uh, you should move. Uh, this is a wonderful singer. One more for Roxanne. WXMAS is proud to present a Christmas Carol. This evening's performance is sponsored by the Better Butter Bureau, Spam, the questionable jam in a can, the Clorox Council, germs face defeat when they're slathered in bleach, and America's national treasure, turpentine. <laughs> and now, the Christmas Carol. Jacob Marley was dead to begin with, though there's no doubt about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, and the undertaker. And Ebenezer Scrooge signed it. <laughs> oh yes, old Marley was dead, dead as a doornail. Scrooge and he were business partners for I don't know how many years. Uh, Scrooge was his sole executor, 
the sole administrator, the sole friend, the sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name on their business line. There it stood after many years above the entrance, Scrooge and Marley. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted Scrooge. No warmth could warm him, no wintry weather chill him. Hard and sharp as flint, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, uh, Oh, my dear Mr. Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? <laughs> Even the blind man's dogs appeared to know him. And when they saw him coming, would tug their owners into doorways and up alleyways. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Old Scrooge, suffered not only from monetary miserliness, but a dire miserliness of the human spirit as well. Our story begins on a cold, snow-swept London street, crowded with merchants, delivery men, steaming horses, and package-laden citizens, all rushing to and fro to be done at home before Christmas Eve becomes Christmas night. Over the door of a decaying wooden building, a faded sign creaks in the wind. It reads, Ebenezer Scrooge and Jacob Marley, brokers. The cramped, musty interior of this establishment is lit only by two candles and the dying glow of a few coal embers in the stove. The only sounds are the scratching of Bob Cratchit's quill and the ticking of a clock. The front door quietly opens and closes. Scrooge's nephew Fred enters silently, removes his top hat, and places a finger to his lips. He winks at Bob Cratchit and tiptoes down the hall to Scrooge's back office and stands unnoticed before Scrooge's desk. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. A uh, humbug. Uh, Christmas a humbug? Uncle, you don't mean that, I am sure. Oh, oh, I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Ah, come then. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. <laughs> What else can I be when I live in a world of fools? Merry Christmas, off upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without any money? A time for balancing your books and finding every item in them held dead against you. <laughs> if I could work my will, every idiot who goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. <laughs> Uncle! Nephew! Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone then. <laughs> much good it has done for you, much good it has ever done for you. Uncle, uh, there are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of when men and women consent to open up their shut-up hearts freely. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will me do me good. And I say, God bless it. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. You should go into Parliament. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Come, uh, dine with us tomorrow. Never, nephew, never. But why? 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 Why did you marry a dowerless girl against my wishes? Uh, because I fell in love. Oh, because you fell in love. Good afternoon. <laughs> Uncle Ebenezer, you <clears throat> never came to see me before I was married. You never met my good wife, Claire, and you have a lovely grandniece. Good afternoon. Ah, 
Uncle, I want nothing from you. You'll get nothing. I ask nothing of you. <laughs> Why cannot we be friends? I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. But I have made my homage to Christmas, and every Yuletide I will petition you, as I have now, to join your only family. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle, and a Happy New Year. That said... Fred turned and made his way down the dark corridor. Scrooge watched him stop at Cratchit's desk, heard them wish each other the best of good tidings, and then Fred wrapped his red muffler around his neck, fixed his hat upon his brow, and went out into the snowy street. Finally. After what seemed an eternity, Cratchit heard the scraping of Scrooge's chair. Closing his ledger, Cratchit rose from his stool, rushed to the coat rack, unhooked Scrooge's black coat, and held it ready. Without a word, Scrooge slipped into his coat, pulled his scarf from Cratchit's cold hands, <coughs> then his hat, and lastly his ivory handle cane. With one hand on the door latch, Scrooge half turned towards Bob Cratchit. You want the entire day off tomorrow, I suppose? Oh, if, if quite convenient, sir. Well, it's not convenient and it's not fair. If I were to charge you half a crown for the day, you'd think I'm yourself ill-used. Oh, no. And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay you a day's wages for no work at all. Uh, 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 but, sir, it's only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here earlier the next morning. Oh, I, I promise that I will, sir. Sir, Mary... Uh, oh, what? Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> Sir. Scrooge sighed, shook his head, lifted the door's latch, and stepped out into the street, muttering to himself about sending Cratchit to an asylum. As he put on his gloves, he noticed three women, elegantly dressed, with colorful velvet capes and matching bonnets. One, a stout woman, held a small ledger in her gloved hands. The other two, their hands tucked into ermine muffs. The stout woman gazed at the faded sign, then, smiling, addressed Scrooge. A Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have we the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Oh, well, we have no doubt his generosity is well represented by his surviving partner. Oh, at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. Uh, and the workhouses, are they still uh, in operation? Oh, they are. I wish I could say they were not, <laughs> but they are. <laughs> well, good. Uh, I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. Well, I'm very glad to hear that that's not the case. So, let them go there. Mr. Scrooge, those institutions scarcely furnish cheer to the mind or body. Thus, Thus, we are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and some means of warmth. Oh, and, and we choose this time of year because it is a time above all others when want is keenly felt and, and abundance rejoices. Now, what shall we put you down for? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, you wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, ladies, here's my answer. I don't make merry at Christmas myself, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. 
I support the establishments that I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Oh, but, but many can't go there, and, and many would rather die. <laughs> well, if they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh. Well, besides, they are not my business. It's enough for a man to know his own business and not interfere with other people's. Mine. Ladies, oh. occupies me constantly. No, no, out of my way. No, no. Oh, shame! Oh, oh dear God! Oh, oh. Harumph! <laughs> Scrooge waved his cane, forcing the ladies back. Oh. Then he walked his way down the crooked lanes toward his house. But before we continue with our story, it's time for a commercial. <laughs> Christmas time, and you're in a jam. If you can't afford a turkey, then reach for the bright blue can and carve your turkey out of Spam. <laughs> That's right, folks. Spam's congealed, meaty goodness can be sculpted into miniature pink turkeys. <laughs> no more fighting over gets who gets the leg or the breast. <laughs> Instead, each member of your family gets their own bird. <laughs> Don't worry about taste. Spam's special formula makes all Spam taste more like meat than meat. <laughs> mm. So good. And for Easter, carve a roast leg of Spam. Serve au jus. Pair with Manischewitz Conquered Grape Wine. Mm. Delicious. A large gray house sits back from the street. Ribbons of fog dip and swirl around its dark exterior. Dark, that is, except for one dusty upstairs window, where two faint shadows move across the ceiling. This is Scrooge's house, bequeathed to him by Jacob Marley. Two maids, Mrs. Dilber and Mrs. Buttwinker, are preparing the bedroom chamber. The only room in the great house that Scrooge chooses to occupy. We'd best hurry along. His self will be home soon. Don't put any more coals in the hearth, Mrs. B. He counts them like they was gold. No, no more than five pieces. Oh, I'm doing the best I can, dearie. You could eat this room till the devil says enough. And it wouldn't warm that skin flinched heart. Look at us, we're not coats to do all the work. I'm glad he only lives in this one room. Aye, and only allowing one candle to see what we're doing here. At least that lets us move the dirt from one dark corner to the other. <laughs> and he's never the wiser for it. He'll <laughs> <laughs> oh. be here soon, so let's do our checklist. Pillows fluffed and bed curtains opened. I, oh, I do love those oh, bed curtains. You really oh. do. Robe and nightcap on bed. I, and the floor dust has been swept into the dark north corner of the room. <laughs> and the special biscuits I made for him is next to his ratty old chair. <laughs> Doing that, Mrs. B. It's Christmas, ain't it? He'll ask, What's this for? Mm -hmm. And we'll say, Everyone gets a little something at Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. It's a gift for ye from us. And we stick out our hands, and he gives us a tip. Ah! <laughs> a tip of his cane on our backsides is the kind of tip we'll get. By the way, he's not going to refuse me biscuits. Mm. They're made with sugar. Flour, sawdust, <laughs> butter, red currants, and um, rabbit raisins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, here he comes. Uh, you hang up his coat and scarf. I'll take the hat and cane. Good evening, sir. What's good about it? What's Buttwinker doing here? This isn't her work day. Oh, uh, I, uh, well, uh, uh, oh, mother died. Oh, uh, this morning, and, and the funeral is Wednesday, and, uh, well, Wednesday is her work day, and 
So I thought she'd come help me today and I'd do her on Wednesday. Oh. <laughs> You did, did you? Yes! <laughs> well, let me tell you both something about funerals, all right? You die, you're put in a box, dropped in a hole, someone mumbles something, they fill the hole, and it doesn't take all day. But, Winker, I expect you to be here first thing on Wednesday or else. Why are your hands out like that? Is there a leak in the ceiling? What's going on here? Um, we're pointing out biscuits, ain't we, Betty? Oh, next to your chair, sir. Everyone gets a little something at Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. You're right, Buttwinker. So, here's one for you and one for you. Now go away and leave me be, and I expect you to be here first thing in the morning, Dilber. But, sir! Christmas Day. It's a holiday. A, a celebration. And celebrate by eating your biscuit. I expect you here first thing in the morning and make sure your mother doesn't die before then. Now get out. Go. Both of you. Scrooge went to the chamber door and secured two large door latches. But why? To keep out what? Hobgoblins? Vengeful maids? Christmas. Then he undressed, put on his nightshirt, struggled into his robe, affixed his nightcap, and settled into the chair in front of his humble fire. Tentatively, he took one of the remaining biscuits, examined it, then bit into it. Black sugar. Then he took a second bite. But suddenly, the chamber became incredibly cold. A wind from an unseen source set the dying coal embers alight. Scrooge leapt from his chair, trembling, and with eyes wide, faced the chamber door. He watched the latches unbolt themselves, one by one. Suddenly, the door burst open. Scrooge, mouth agape, beheld a specter. It was whole, and yet not whole. The specter advanced towards him, its tattered form slowed in its progress by massive chains and weights. Scrooge! Scrooge! Ebenezer! Scrooge! What do you want with me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Uh, who were you then? You look familiar. In life, I was your partner. Jacob Marley? Uh, uh, but you're, you're, uh, uh, you don't believe in me. <laughs> well, uh, no, honestly, Jacob, if that's who you are, then I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality? Beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Well, because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat them. For all I know, you could be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, the, the fragment of an underdone potato, a, a sour curtain in a biscuit. Yeah, there's more of gravy than you grave about you, whatever you are. You're humbug, I tell you, humbug! No! Oh, mercy, mercy, I mean, humbug, you dreadful spirit. Mercy, why do you trouble me? Oh, man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I, I do, I do, I do, I do, I do, I must. I, I, but, but, Jacob, why, why does your spirit walk the earth? Why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk among his fellow man and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I am doomed to wander through the world and witness what I cannot share but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. <laughs> uh, Jacob, you're, you're, you're wrapped in chains and, and weighted cash boxes. Tell me why. I wear the chains I forged in life. I made them link by link 
and yard by yard. Is their pattern strange to you? Or would you know the weight and length of the chains you wear yourself? They were as full and as heavy and as long as mine seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on them since. They are ponderous chains. <laughs> Jacob, old Jacob Mollis, speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. <laughs> A very little more is all that is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. Mock me, Ebenezer Scrooge. In life... I never rove beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Yes. Mankind was my business. Oh. At this time of the rolling year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of my fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raised them to that blessed star that led the wise men to that poor abode? Oh, oh, hear me, Ebenezer Scrooge. My time is nearly gone. Ebenezer, I am here tonight to tell you you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring. <laughs> you are always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you, thank you. You very much. will be haunted by three spirits this very night. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned? It is. Uh, I'd rather not. No, no, I don't think I'd rather. Not. <laughs> Without their visits, Ebenezer, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first when the bell tolls one. Uh, couldn't I take them all at once and have it over with me? Then no, expect the know. second, then the third to follow when the last stroke of three ceases to vibrate. Oh, 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 oh look to see me no more. Ah, 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 ah. Jacob! Jacob! But Marley had left. <laughs> Not through the door, but through the wall. Scrooge stood immobile in the middle of his bedroom. Then, with a shudder, returned to himself. He ran to the door, rebolted it, shuffled quickly to his bed, and pulled the bed curtains closed around him. Oh, he shivered under the covers and awaited the chiming of the hour. Within moments, however, Scrooge had fallen into a, a deep, welcome sleep. Now, while Scrooge sleeps, we'll hear from our next sponsor, the Better Butter Bureau. Why, thank you, Carl. Lorna Holstein here. This portion of our show is blissfully brought to you by the Better Butter Bureau. Ladies, churn dark days into sunshine by slathering anything edible with the golden goodness of butter. Now, here's your nutrition tip for today. Start your family's day by giving them a cup of hot butter. It helps to lubricate their arteries and their veins. And for naughty butterlicious fun, freeze pats of butter rock hard, serve them to your in-laws, and enjoy their frustration as they try to spread it on Wonder Bread. <laughs> so give them all a little pat of butter. And remember, ladies, it's not butter if it doesn't come from the udder. <laughs> Scrooge awoke from his deep sleep with a start and sat bolt upright, <clears throat> frozen in the inky dark, listening. The only sound he heard was the fierce beating of his heart. <laughs> 
<laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. Humbug, humbug, humbug. He was about to settle back down when the bed curtain suddenly flew open and a light, momentarily brighter than the sun, filled the room. Then, slowly diminished to a pulsating glow that shimmered like the aurora around the figure now before him. It had the body of an adult, and yet its countenance was that of a sweet child. Its hair was long, white, and it flowed and danced from side to side, whipped by an unknown wind. Scrooge, wide-eyed and seemingly spellbound, addressed the unearthly vision before him. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who or what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Uh, spirit, I, I have no intention to offend, but uh, what business do you have here? Your welfare. My, my, my <laughs> uh, spirit, I'm much obliged, but I cannot help thinking that a good night of unbroken rest would be much weather for my blood. Your reclamation, then. Scrooge, rise. Touch my hand and walk with me. Scrooge reluctantly rose, and it extended a shaking hand. The spirit's touch was that of a gentle woman's, and once attached, he felt like a child again. He also balked like one when he saw she was guiding him towards his now open window. No, 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 no. I, I'm mortal. I'm liable to fall. <laughs> the spirit turned placed her other hand on his heart. Fear not, Ebenezer, for you shall be upheld in more than this. Scrooge closed his eyes and felt only the gentle tug of her hand as they passed through the wall. When he opened his eyes, he was dumbstruck by the surroundings, for he was outdoors on the crest of a hill, overlooking a large gray stone building. He was still in his night clothes, standing in a snow-covered lane, but Scrooge felt neither cold nor wet. Good heavens, I was schooled in this place. I was a student here. Oh, and there is my old school itself. These are but shadows of things that have been. They have no awareness of us. Seems so deserted. Why, it's Christmas time, and everyone has left for the holidays. Scrooge closed his eyes and emitted a deep sigh. When he opened them, he found himself inside a cavernous study hall with row upon row of tables with their chairs inverted atop them. All that is, except for one chair, turned towards the great hearth, and it sat a, a young boy, quite alone, reading. This is where your father made you spend many a Christmas alone, while all your classmates were celebrating at home. I know, I, I, I know, I know, I know. Take heed, Ebenezer. There! Oh, dear brother, dear, dear brother! I've come to bring you home, dear brother to bring you home, home, home. Home, home little fan. <laughs> yes, home for good, home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be that home's like heaven. He spoke to me so gently one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to never, ever come back here. Oh, dear, dear brother. We're to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in the whole world. Oh, you are quite the woman, little fan. Oh, yes, home. I'll happily go with you, sister. Is that a tear upon your cheek? No, it's nothing. Fan was always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered. But she had a strong heart. So she had. 
She died, a woman, and had, I think, children. One child, his name is Fred. My nephew, Fred. His first breath became her last breath, my dear Fred. Such was the fate of your own mother. She also died, giving you life. A theft of life for which your father had blamed you for many years. Let us move on to the time when you were a young man. Close your eyes. Scrooge reluctantly obeyed and felt the spirit take his hand. He also felt a tugging against himself, as if he were passing through a, a thick ether. He soon found himself standing inside the entrance of a large wooden warehouse. The floor had been cleared and was swept clean. Workers, male and female, were dressing a large banquet table with holly and candles. The table seemed to sag from the weight of roast, kegs of beer, punch bowls, and many cheeses. On one side, near the front entrance, a row of high-topped desks was occupied by a bevy of clerks. Do you know this place? <laughs> know it? I was apprenticed here at Mr. Fezziwig's. Scrooge stared in awe at one of the lads seated at a desk. For it was Scrooge himself as a handsome and fit young man, seemingly happy in his work. From an office emerged two men, one a young man around Scrooge's age, the other a portly older man whose smile and bulging waistcoat herald a life well led. It's Fezziwig, oh bless his heart, it's old Fezziwig alive again. Hilly ho, everyone. Yep, no more work tonight. Hilly ho, it's Christmas Eve. Yep, Ebenezer, lads, clear your desks to the side of the room before they're tumbled into splinters by our dancing. Ah, hilly ho, open the doors and let our guests enter. <laughs> the doors swung open. A bow-legged <coughs> fiddler was the first to come through, already playing his fiddle which was tuned like 50 stomach aches. <laughs> Led by the plump and smiling Mrs. Fezziwig, <laughs> a boisterous gaggle of employees, families, children, and guests poured into the welcoming space. Among them, a dainty young beauty named Belle, whose slender finger later this evening would reveal a modest ring pledged to her by an adoring Ebenezer Scrooge. No ho there, Ebenezer! I want you to meet our new apprentice, young Jacob Marley. He'll be working with you, Ebenezer. You two boys, take a moment to get acquainted. Well, while I go retrieve Mrs. Fezziwig away from the punch bowl before she gets punched by the punch. <laughs> <laughs> Hilly ho, everyone! Welcome! Are you a good worker, Mr. Marley? I work hard, Ebenezer, very hard. I wish to pursue the changing world of finance. There's money to be made in this new era of industry. It will belong to the shrewd financier. I want to touch money, Mr. Scrooge, not a shovel. You do understand the opportunities I speak of, don't you, sir? Aye, aye, Jacob, I do. Well, I feel that we may have much in common, Ebenezer. Let us talk after the holiday. But now, I'm off to see if there is any punch in Fezziwig's punch. Merry Christmas, Ebenezer. Uh, Merry Christmas, Jacob. I, I look forward to hearing more about uh, your plans. But now, it's Christmas. Belle! Belle, are you ready to dance? Spirit, I feel as though I'm out of my wits. My, my, my heart and soul are in this place. What memories! <laughs> How I enjoyed everything. Oh, Fezziwig. <laughs> The, the happiness he gave is, is, is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. Ah, we're all so full of happiness and gratitude. Hmm. And yet, what did it cost? A pittance. Hmm. A nothing. Hmm. Oh. oh, poor old Fezziwig. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, ghost, I, I feel the strangest agitation. Perhaps it's the memory that in... Later years, you and your worldly business partner, Marley, forced dear old Fezziwig out of his business 
for a fraction of its true value. <laughs> My time grows short. Close your eyes. Rouge squeezed his eyes closed and bowed his head, chastened by this painful memory. When he opened them, he found himself seated on a bench in a rose garden. The fiddle tunes of Christmas now replaced by the sounds of spring. Across from him sat a somewhat older belle. Her brow was furrowed, a handkerchief twisted in her fingers. Scrooge, now a man in his prime, whose countenance began to wear the signs of avarice. Oh, there was a greedy, restless motion in his eyes that exposed the dark passion that had taken root within him. The Scrooge sat next to Belle. His gaze avoided her tear-stained face. Ebenezer, I must speak frankly and from my heart. Another idol has displaced me. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. Mm -hmm. There is nothing the world condemns such as with severity as the pursuit of wealth. But, dear Belle, there is nothing, nothing so grave as poverty. You fear the world too much, Ebenezer. Oh, I've grown wiser. But, but, but I am not changed towards you, am I? <clears throat> Ebenezer, our engagement is now an old one. It was made when we were both poor, and I thought content to be so until we could improve our fortune by our patient industry. When our engagement was made, you were another man. But that is true no longer. And I now release you. If you were free today, can I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You who weigh everything by gain? Here. Take this ring that I have worn these years with patient hope. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Goodbye, Ebenezer. Spirit, remove me from this place. I cannot stand it. I told you that these were but shadows of things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Leave me! Leave me! <laughs> and so the ghost did by glowing as bright as the sun, forcing Scrooge to cover his eyes in the dark crook of his arm. And in that dark, he felt himself falling in a most unpleasant descent. He flailed for support and grasped the darkness itself until the falling stopped. How can that be, he thought. Then, opening his eyes, found himself sitting up in his own bed, his hands gripping the curtain. With relief, Scrooge fell back onto his pillow. Ha, 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 ha! Ah, Scrooge! Ebenezer Scrooge, come forward and know me better, man! Scrooge peeked through his bed curtains and saw a light fanning out from beneath his chamber door. He arose, shuffled across the room, and unlatched the door. And into the doorway of what had been a vacant room, he could only stare at the incomprehensibility of what was before him. The once dank walls were now decorated with holly and ivy. Heaped upon the floor were cooked turkeys, suckling pigs, and platters of roasts, steaming plum pudding, and hot bowls of punch were everywhere. Atop this mountain of food sat a jolly giant, wrapped in a long green robe, trimmed in white fur. He had a full red beard with crimson locks, and the entire panorama was lit by a blazing golden torch that he held aloft. Come in, look upon me. Well, you have never seen the likes of me before. <laughs> never. And I wish it had been indefinitely postponed. <laughs> but tonight, if you have something to show me or teach me, then let me profit by it, spirit. Conduct me where you will. Touch the sleeve of my robe. Oh, not again. 
<laughs> Reaching over a brace of quail and a pile of sausages, Scrooge touched it, and when he released it, found himself standing in a narrow street in front of a low roof stucco house with only a small front window and a well-worn plank door. Who's your fitting house is this? That's your clerks. Look through their window and watch and listen as they sit for their Christmas meal, well, such as it is. Remember, you are unseen and unheard by all but me. How did our little Tim behave in church? Oh, as good as gold and better. He told me, coming home, that he hoped people saw him because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Tiny Tim is growing strong and hearty, isn't he, my dear? Yes, yes, of course he is. Martha, Peter, Belinda, Tim, come to the table before the goose gets cold. Hooray, Father, there never was such a goose. A goose, spirit. I've seen pox chickens bigger than this. We won't be able to finish it. It is so plentiful. Oh, so true, Martha. Now, take up your mugs. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Bless, bless us. us. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will do. I see a crutch without an owner. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, 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 kind spirit. As you say, he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, what then? Ah, if he be like to die, he'd better do it and decrease the surplus Man. population. Man, will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. This delicious punch requires another toast. Mr. Scrooge, I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Oh, the founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. Ah, oh, my dear, Christmas Day for the children. I'll drink to his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. <coughs> to Mr. Scrooge. We'll leave the Cratches to enjoy their punch and bring Wanda Woodwax to the microphone to tell us what the Turpentine Council is recommending this holiday season. Thank you, Carl. Friends, do you suffer from gout? Harry warts, black lung, or bubonic plague? <laughs> Are you tired of your children having croup, whooping cough, measles, mumps, appendicitis, bronchitis, or the vapors? Did you know that turpentine, administered properly, fights infection, removes all kinds of anything from your skin and will freshen your breath like nothing you've ever tried. Ah, ah turpentine! turpentine. <laughs> Scrooge lingered at the Cratchit's window, watching the family during their humble celebration, when the ghost of Christmas present gave him a now familiar command. Touch my robe. Oh. Scrooge soon found himself in the inviting parlor of a home he'd never seen before. It was his nephew, Fred's. They were having after-dinner sherry with their guests. <laughs> Oh, oh, Fred, oh, tell oh, everyone what Uncle Scrooge said to you. Well, he said that Christmas was a humbug, and he believes it too. <laughs> However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Well, I do, Fred. He didn't come to our wedding. He's never met his only niece, and you keep asking him to come here. And what do you get for an answer? 
Humbug! <laughs> Here he takes it into his head to dislike us. What's the consequence? Well, he don't lose much of a dinner. Fred, oh, I think he loses a very good dinner. Here, here. <laughs> Indeed he does, my love. None better. Now let us play a yes and no. Oh, oh Spirit, yes. I know this game. I want to play too. Remember, they can't see you nor hear you. You all know how to play. Yes. Yeah. The category is live animals. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, is it a... a Oh, oh, yes. Uh, does oh. it growl and grunt sometimes? Oh. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. A bear. No. Oh. <laughs> a, a tiger. No. Oh, 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 oh. Is it an ass? No. Oh, I know what it is, everyone. I know, I know, I know, I know what it yes. is. What oh. one is it? It's Fred's Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> He, he has given us plenty of merriment, as well as disappointment. But it would be ungrateful of me not to drink to his health. So I say, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to Uncle Scrooge. Uncle, Uncle Scrooge. Scrooge! A downcast Scrooge did not have to be prompted by the spirit. He closed his eyes, touched the ghost's robe, and soon felt the robe slipped from his grasp as he stumbled to his knees onto the frozen earth. Scrooge now found himself in a snow-crusted field on the outskirts of town. He beheld the spirit some distance away, a low fog dancing around the spirit's feet, his red beard now as white as the surrounding snow, and the flame of his torch was slowly diminishing. Spirit, it has been a long night. If only it is a night. How can this be? And it is strange too, Spirit, that you grow older. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Hark, the time is drawing nigh. Forgive me if, if, if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange coming out of the mist that surrounds you. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw for the flesh that is upon it. Look here. Observe these children. The parting fog revealed two emaciated children. They are tattered rags, barely covering their skeletal features. Their eyes, feral and piercing, Scrooge recoils. Spirit, are they yours? They are man's, and they cling to me. This frightful boy is ignorant. This wretched girl is want. Beware of them both, and of all their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see that written, which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Have they, have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Uh, are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no workhouses? Scrooge, upon hearing his own words cast upon him, fell to the ground covering his ears. Thus he remained until the echo of his callous words left him. As Scrooge arose, a heart-freezing chill passed through him. Turning, his eyes widened as he observed a, a phantom floating through the mist towards him, its dark robe and hood exposing nothing except a pale hand pointing a long, bony finger at him. Uh, I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You, you are about to show me the shadows of things that have not happened but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? <laughs> oh, ghost of a future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know that your purpose is to do me good and I am hoping to be another man from what I was, 
I'm prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Then lead on, spirit. I feel that the night is waning fast and it is precious time to me. The phantom passed its bloodless hand, overscrewed his eyes, and suddenly he found himself in a dark corner of the Cratchit house. He observed the Cratchit family, minus Bob and Tiny Tim, the others seated on the floor surrounding Mrs. Cratchit, who with a Bible on her lap, stared with the others into the dwindling fire. Father seems to be walking a little slower these days, Mother. Oh, I've known him to walk very fast with Tiny Tim on his shoulder. But then he was very light to carry, and his father loved him, so it was no trouble. No trouble. Father! Father! Mother! Uh, uh, I'm a little late, my dears. Please forgive me. Oh, Robert, you must be cold and tired. Sit no, by no, the fire. I, I'm very content, my dear. Very content. I went to see the place where Tim will rest. It's sheltered by trees, and it, it's very quiet and still. It was strange, but as I stood there, I felt his hand slip into mine as if he was sitting beside me and comforting me. He was telling me in his own way that he is happy, truly happy, and that we must cease to grieve for him and try to be happy too. No, oh, Tim, my sweet Tim. Oh, Father. Oh, Tim. Scrooge clutched at his heart. Not since the death of his beloved sister, Fan, had he known an agony such as he felt at that moment. But in an instant, the specter brought Scrooge to an obscure part of London. The ways were dark and narrow, occupied by the drunken and desperate. Ugly alleys and gutters disgorged their offensive smells of both the living and the dead. It was under a low, collapsed roof at the end of an alley that the phantom had Scrooge halt. Through the smoke, hanging chains, and stacks of rusty iron sat old Joe, the gnarled owner of the piles of surrounding debris. Soon, two shadowy forms wove their way through his cramped quarters, each carrying large bundles. Ah, ha, 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 ah, my lovelies, uh, come into me parlor and gather round me fair beauties. <laughs> Let old Joe see your uh, treasures. Oh, you ain't so old, Joe. Here, look into me bundle, Joe. I want to know the value of me goods. Mm. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? <laughs> Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> if he wanted to keep them after he was dead, the wicked old screw. He'd have had somebody looking in on him when he was struck with death. Instead of lying there, gasping out his last breath, alone by itself. It's the truest word ever was spoke. It's a judgment it on is, him. It is. It's time, Joe. Let me know the value of me treasures. Let me see what's here. A pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, a porridge bowl and spoon. Ooh, still crusted, I see. Uh, a pair of sugar tongs. Uh, no sugar bowl? No. Oh, never mind. Oh, and what's this? One boot? Where's its mate? Oh, never mind. I know a one legged fellow would give his leg to own it. <laughs> well, here's three shillings, sixpence. Uh, that's your account, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled in oil. <laughs> I always give too much to ladies. It's it's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. That's your account! If you ask me for another penny, I'll repent of being too liberal and knock off half. Uh, who's next? <laughs> 
And, and now my band on, Joe. Ah, what do you call this? Bed curtains? Aye, ah, bed curtains. You don't mean to say you <laughs> took them down, rings and all, with with him lying there? Aye, well, I do. <laughs> he never even blinked when I did so. Woman! <laughs> <laughs> You were born to make your fortune, and you'll certainly do it. Oh, are these his blankets? Well, who else's do you think? He ain't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. Really? I hope he didn't die of anything catching. Oh, and what's this? A nightshirt. Oh, woman, don't tell me oh, you took it off the porch. they wasted it if it hadn't been for me. It's what true. do you mean, wasted it? Well, they have buried him in it. That's what. Mm -hmm. oh. I took him off him and gave him an old calico one. <laughs> he didn't seem to mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he frightened everyone when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Joe. Have a biscuit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> While old Joe enjoys his biscuit, we'll enjoy a word from another one of our sponsors, Clorox Toothpaste. And this Halla, Hannah Hollybush. Oil your teeth with refreshing Clorox Toothpaste. Clorox Toothpaste keeps tartar, and anything else, from forming. The secret of its wonderful cleansing power is in hydrochloric acid, the ox in Clorox Toothpaste. It dissolves with water and cleans out the space between teeth that even a dentist drill can't penetrate. Keep a second tooth in the laundry. A little squirt will take out stubborn stains. Look for the smiling ox on the tube. Thank you, Miss Hannah Hollywood. <laughs> and now, the last chapter of A Christmas Carol. Realizing that there was something unusually familiar about the transaction he had just witnessed, Scrooge petitioned the Phantom to remove him from the vile surroundings. In a blinding instant, Scrooge found himself under the stone arch of a cemetery entrance. A forest of gravestones lay before him. The dark Phantom gestured for Scrooge to come forward while his other skeletal finger pointed to a particular stone draped in black cloth. Tearful and shaking, Scrooge approached the covered tablet. Before I remove the shroud from, from the stone, please answer me one question. Are, are these the shadows of things that will be only? Hear me, spirit. Uh, men's past actions uh, will foreshadow certain ends uh, uh, to which, if persevered, they must lead to. But if their actions be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. Scrooge pulled the cloth from the stone <laughs> and read the inscribed name. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, 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 spirit, no, please, please, hear me. I am not the man I was. I, I, I will not be the man I must have been. Why show me this if I, if I am beyond all hope? Assure me that I may change the shadows I have been shown this night by an altered life. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Please, spirit, tell me I may wipe away the writing on the stone. Please, I beg you. I am not the man I was. I am not the man I was. I am not the man I was. I am not the. I am not the. I am. I am. I am. I am not. I am. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is not the cover on my headstone. This is. This is my bed curtains. And this is my bedroom <laughs> with blessed daylight streaming through my windows. Thank you, Jacob, Molly, oh, heaven and Christmas be praised for this. I say it on my knees, Jacob, on my knees. <laughs> I, I don't, don't, don't know what to do. I, I, I'm as light as a feather. I'm, I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as charity as a schoolboy. I'm as giddy as a drunken man. <laughs> oh, it's all right. It's all true. It all happened. Ah. 
<laughs> Who could this be? Ah, maybe it's Christmas present returning with some sausages. <laughs> Coming, Christmas present! <laughs> Uh, good morning, sir. Oh, it's you, Dober. Now, come, in, come in, come in, come in. Uh, Dober, tell me what the day is. Why, it's Christmas Day, of course, sir. Ah, then I haven't missed it. The spirits must have done everything in one night. Well, of course they can, the spirits. <laughs> Are you quite yourself, sir? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I, no, I don't think so. I, I hope not. <laughs> uh, look, Dilba, look, there are my bed curtains. They're still here. You didn't take them. <laughs> ah, well, they're not cheery enough anyway. You can have them. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mrs. Dilba. What? 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 Thank you, sir. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what time of day it is. I, I don't know how long I've been in the, amongst the spirits. I don't know anything. Well, I never did know anything, but I know <laughs> that I don't know anything. I, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I, Mrs. Gilbert, how about giving us a hug? <laughs> No, 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 Mrs. Please, Mrs. Gilbert, stop running. Stop running around. I'm not mad. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, here, in my room. Here, here. Here it is for you, Mrs. Dilber. Oh, what's that coin for? To keep me mouth shut? No, 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 no Mrs. Dilber. It's a Christmas present. A Christmas present? For me? For you, <laughs> from me. A merry, merry Christmas. Oh, God. How much do I pay you? Four shillings a week. Oh, well, let me see. It has to carry the one that is. Now it'll be ten shillings. <gasps> so, oh, are you sure you don't want to see a doctor? Uh, certainly not, nor an undertaker either. Now, no work for you on Christmas Day. Go buy yourself some gin and then go home and bake some more of those delicious biscuits. <laughs> Mr. Scrooge. Yes. Bless you. And. Uh, Merry Christmas in keeping with the situation. <laughs> Good drive, sir. Situation? What situation? Oh my God. I, I, I must let fresh air into this room. Oh, glorious, glorious day. <laughs> Hello, boy. You, there in the street. Yes, you. Sir, me? Yes, you. Uh, do you know the market on the corner on the next street? Well, I sure hope I do. Oh, but an intelligent boy. <laughs> A remarkable boy. Lad, do you know if they sold the prize turkey hanging in the window? Uh, what? The one as big as me? <laughs> what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my book. Oh, yeah, it's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Eh, uh, take a walk. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, I, I'm in earnest. Go and bring back the turkey, the grocer and his wagon, that I may give them direction where to take it. Here, whoa, whoa, here's a shilling to get you going. Come back with them in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. Oh, yes, sir! Oh, look at him go, a natural athlete. <laughs> oh, I'll send it anonymously to the Cratchit. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. <laughs> Later that morning, a sprightly, smiling Scrooge, wearing his best silk shirt and finery, tipped his hat to all he passed. When he arrived at his nephew's home, he sprang up the steps, took a deep breath, and gently knocked. When the door opened, he beheld for the first time ever the sweet face of a little girl. Scrooge bent down for a moment and studied her radiant innocence. He found himself choking back an unsolicited tear. And you are? My name is Fan. Yeah. Yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Are you here to join us for Christmas? Oh, I hope so, dear Fan. For this one and many more. Hurrah! Come on, I'll take you to the parlor. But, Papa, look! Uncle Scrooge! Oh, dear oh. heart alive! Uh, just I, uh, will you let me in, Fred? Well, of course, dear Uncle. You are welcome, so very welcome. Uh, Merry Christmas to you, nephew, <coughs> and especially to you, Claire. Uh, can you ever forgive a foolish, selfish old man? Of course, dear uncle. Come in, join our guests. 
We're about to play a game called Yes and No. Do you know it? Oh, I guess I know it very well. <laughs> they played happily for hours, then feasted on a delicious dinner, during which Scrooge and Little Fan giggled and whispered <laughs> to each other, so much so that Claire had to laughingly admonish them both. It was late when Scrooge finally bid good night. That evening in his chamber, he slept a wonderfully deep and dreamless sleep. <laughs> Early the next morning, Scrooge hummed his way along the sun-splashed streets to his office. Merry Christmas. Turning a corner, he spied the three ladies who had previously approached him for alms. He cornered them as they exited a tea shop. Uh, my, uh, my dear ladies, a good morning to you. Oh, it's Mr. Scrooge, ladies. Well, yes, that is my name, and, and I fear I was exceeding... Harumph! Oh, oh, please, ladies, I, it's, I'm so sorry. I know I've been unpleasant to you, so allow me to apologize to you all and contribute this. Oh, 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 Lord bless us, oh, Mr. Scrooge. Are you quite serious? Oh, my dear sir. We don't know what to say to such yeah. generosity. Uh, don't say anything, please. But do come and visit with me sometime soon, will you, lady? <gasps> oh, we we will. Will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Obliged to you. Ta-ta. Ta-ta. <laughs> Scrooge arrived at his office earlier than usual. He hurriedly lit candles, stoked the coal stove to the bursting point, and chuckling, sat behind his desk, waiting for Bob Cratchit, who he knew would be late. Cratchit! Come back here. <laughs> what do you mean by coming here this time of day? I, I'm very sorry, sir. It shall not be repeated. Mm. I was making rather too merry yesterday. It won't be repeated. Uh, humbug, you hear me? Humbug, I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. You give me no choice, therefore I'm about to raise your salary. But, sir, I promise I'll... <laughs> Wait, wh what did you just say? Oh, I'm going to raise your salary with a look on your face, Bob. Oh, <laughs> I haven't taken leave of my senses. I, I, I've come to them. But my, my goodness, I, I don't know what to say, sir. Are you sure you're all right? Don't say a word, Bob. I've never felt better. It is a gift to be alive. Heed me. From this moment on, I shall see that all your needs are met and joy fills your family and your home. I'd like, with your permission, to expend all effort in making Tiny Tim whole and healthy. Yes, and... Well, well, no sense trying to get any work out of either of us today. So let's go to the headless goat and celebrate. <laughs> uh, what is there your son Tim says? Uh, God bless us, everyone. <clears throat> Aye, God bless us, everyone. This concludes our XMAS annual presentation of A Christmas Carol. We wish to thank our sponsors, Spam, Turpentine, Clorox Toothpaste, and the Better Butter Bureau. On behalf of all of us at the station, thanks for listening, and have a very Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, everyone! WXMAS Spam Cooking Show <laughs> next week live. So come. Drive home carefully. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful Christmas. <laughs>